if I can have your attention, please. I want to welcome everyone to our Saturday night keynote speaker conference, and I want to welcome everyone that is attending worldwide by live stream video. Our featured speaker tonight is a person that I have tremendous admiration for, for the incredible work and the body of work that Graham Hancock has done. He has taken research in a scientific academic level and challenged the orthodox views on our world history. And it takes a man of considerable, not just intelligence, but of strength to be able to push through the old energy of the thick, insulated academic world. The work that Graham Hancock is doing is absolutely changing the paradigm, changing the way we view our past. And as he has said many times, we are a species with amnesia. Perfectly phrased. We are a species who do not know our true past. And Graham is a brilliant light, an amazing pioneer who is showing us despite unjustified resistance, who we are. A round of applause for Graham Hancock, please. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Good evening. I, I'm in the dark. Let's, uh, I, I want to be in the dark because I want to show you images, but let's put the light up just for a second and actually so we can all see each other. I think that would be, that would be nice. There is a text in ancient Egypt that says, Hello, Hello light. A text in ancient Egypt that says, the truth is great and mighty, and it has never been broken since the time of Osiris. The only problem is that none of us have a monopoly on the truth. None of us really know what the truth is. We're all seekers after the truth. And in this seeking after the truth, it's important to be able to have honest disagreements. We must, as researchers in this field, be able to openly and honestly express our feelings about any and every issue without fear, without fear of a witch hunt, without fear of being accused of a thought crime. Because only in that way can we hope to approach gradually, slowly, step by step to that great and mighty truth that rings down the ages. I want to start by, as the last speaker did, it's very important to recognize our partnerships in life. And uh, I owe everything to my beautiful wife, Santa, who's a photographer, who takes all the photographs in, in, in my books. She's, she's, she's gifted me with that, with that privilege. We have traveled and worked together for 25 years. We've been at the bottom of the ocean together multiple times, scuba diving after underwater ruins, and, and we've been at the top of the Great Pyramid. Santa is a source of inspiration and of truth for me, I would long ago have fallen off the path into the bottomless abyss if this wonderful lady had not been by my side. So now we can turn the lights down a little bit here. Um, 
anatomically modern human beings, as far as we know, have been on this planet for at least 200,000 years. We may have been on it much longer than that. The next turn of the archaeologist's spade, as we all know, can change everything. But as the story is told now, and it's just another story, the descent from the last common ancestor with the chimpanzee begins about six million years ago, and we start to become more and more recognizable physically as, as human beings down through the millions of years. But it's only apparently about 200,000 years ago that we have anatomically modern humans. As I say, it could be earlier. The anatomically modern form, the anatomically modern brain, we can say for sure it's at least 200,000 years old. And right there I have a question. If we, with all our capacities, have been present on the planet for at least 200,000 years, why did we wait for 195,000 years to form the first civilization? <laughs> or is it possible that we've lost part of our story, that something's missing? That's what I want to look into tonight. I'm going to take you on a journey, and it may be quite a long journey, an hour and a half, something like that. We'll see. <sighs> Historians and archaeologists give us a, a timeline of the human story. Um, the Upper Paleolithic, the Paleolithic, the Stone Age, the Old Stone Age. Uh, our ancestors are supposed to have been entirely hunter-gatherers, nomads, moving from place to place with no specialists, no discipline, no organization, no, no societal uh, or, or organization. And then gradually we merge into the, the Neolithic, uh, the New Stone Age. Uh, and on down from there, some thousands of years past, the early Neolithic would be 11,000 years ago or so, but some thousands of years pass and, and, and we begin to create megalithic monuments around five or 6,000 years ago. This is the established narrative, okay? This is the mainstream narrative. And around the same time, we start to make the first recognizable civilizations. This is our story. This is what I call the, uh, the house of history, the house that has been built by historians and archaeologists. But there's a problem. And that problem comes from new science, science that is not yet even eight years old, new information. And that is that right in the foundation of the story of the origins of civilization, a global cataclysm occurred between 12,800 and 11,600 years ago, an extinction-level event. And unfortunately for the house of history, this global cataclysm has not yet been taken into account at all in the model that we are taught of the origins of civilization. Actually, I don't blame historians and archaeologists for that, because the information is so new uh, and, and really has been confined to the rarefied atmosphere of leading scientific journals that I don't believe they've had time to build it into the model. But it raises the possibility, however well built the house of history may be for the last 9,000 years or so, it raises the possibility that the house of history stands on foundations of sand. And we all know what happens to houses that are built on foundations of sand. Ah, the mystery, the mystery, the beautiful mystery of it all. It dilates the imagination to consider the possibilities of the past. Sometimes I think it dilates the imagination too much. I'll not make myself popular by, by saying this, but I am not uh, a great fan of the ancient astronaut uh, hypothesis. It isn't that um, I haven't had encounters with aliens, because I have, under the influence of ayahuasca. I have, I have communicated with intelligences that are definitely not of this realm. I believe that reality is complex and multi-layered, but after 25 years of walking the walk, across the most amazing sacred ancient sites in the world, I am yet to find anything, any single thing, that I could only explain with a level of technology capable of crossing interstellar space. And therefore, I prefer, I prefer the notion to explain the many anomalies that we may be dealing with a forgotten episode 
in human history. Baalbek in the Lebanon is often cited uh, as a place uh, that was a kind of landing, a landing platform of, of the gods, of the Anunnaki, and, and so on. Uh, and it's suggested that the huge platform at, at Baalbek is a megalithic platform made of giant stones. And those stones had to be so big so that they could support the weight of the alien landing craft. I just want to review that notion a, a little bit. Remember, we're on a search for truth here. Um, I am sitting here uh, in the platform, uh, on, on top of the platform, uh, where the Romans built a, a temple dedicated to the god Jupiter. Those are the six remaining columns of the 54 that once surrounded what is definitely a, a Roman temple. I don't think anybody disputes that the temple is Roman. The question is, what did the Romans build on top of? What were the earlier foundations? What's the backstory of uh, Baalbek? As I'm sitting here, I hear um, heavy artillery and machine guns going off in the background. We're only about five miles from the Syrian border. Uh, and uh, as we know, that's a, that's a problematic area. But I, I calm my mind and uh, get into this amazing, amazing place. Just to, to give you a sense of it, I, I hope it's clear, but this is the rectangular area where I'm sitting. And those red dots along there, those represent those columns. And they're on the south side of the platform. Down below the platform, and actually separate from it, is a wall of gigantic megalithic blocks. And these megalithic blocks, we're on the south side now. That's that wall running along there. These uh, megalithic blocks weigh up to 500 tons. The wall actually surrounds the platform on three sides, nowhere touching it. That's the south side. Let's have a look at the north side. There's the north side of the same megalithic wall. Gigantic megaliths. But the platform itself is built of rather much smaller stones that uh, any culture could manipulate easily. Let's look again at that wall. There's that megalithic wall. There's me for scale. I'm not sure this image is in focus, to be honest. It doesn't look in focus. There's me for, for scale. There's these huge megalithic blocks in the range of 500 tons each. And there, let's look down at the top of that freestanding wall. Those are the big megaliths at Baalbek. I'm going to show you the western side of the wall in a moment. The platform itself is not made of giant megaliths. The wall is a separate freestanding entity that surrounds the platform on three sides. And anybody who actually goes there and does the work will see that. And there's the problem with the alien landing craft argument. If the platform is supposed to have been made of huge megaliths, fine, but it isn't. The platform's made of small and ordinary stones. And I don't believe that anybody is going to land a landing craft on top of this wall. So the enigma of the wall, uh, I do not believe, is explained by the landing craft argument. Let's go around to the west side, where the really huge blocks are. 25 or 30 feet above the ground. These are three blocks, each of which weighs 900 tons. There I am for scale. That's the trilithon, as it's called, those three giant blocks. See that gap in the wall there? That's that gap. And there I'm actually sitting on top of the southernmost of the three 900-ton blocks of the trilithon. It's separate, does not touch the temple platform. In front of my right foot, this dark stone here, that is put forward by archaeologists as their pillar argument against any earlier origins to Baalbek. Let me explain why. Because that dark stone turns out to be a fragment of a Roman column drum. There it is excavated. It's in the foundations of the megalithic wall. There's a Roman temple up at the top. So the point of view of archaeology is we have a Roman column drum that's been recycled and used in the foundations. And we have a Roman temple on the very top. Obviously, the Romans did the whole thing. 
I don't think the Romans did the whole thing. What the archaeologists are not taking account of is the history of Baalbek, which was used as a fortress for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years from the beginning of the Islamic period around 600 AD onwards, was repeatedly attacked, was bombarded with those huge mangonels, those, those, those catapults throwing rocks at the walls. Uh, the walls were systematically undermined by mining parties who would seek to collapse the walls. And afterwards, repairs were made. And in those repairs, I believe that this Roman column drum was put in uh, to replace an undermined foundation. Now, I put that to the archaeologists, and they said, of the German Archaeological Institute who run the dig at, at Baalbek, uh, and they said, no, no, uh, the work is too good to be an Arab repair. Uh, this is definitely, this is definitely Roman work. The Arabs couldn't do anything like that. So I spent a lot of time going around the site, and I found a wall that was repaired and rebuilt by the Arabs, and it's really interesting to see what's in it. There's that wall, and in it, right there, is a Roman column drum. And if we get a little bit closer, that Roman column drum is fitted as tightly and as beautifully as this one. So I don't think the argument uh, of the mainstream stands up. And it gets even more difficult when we go to the quarry. Because there, sitting in the quarry, are blocks that beggar the imagination. This one, they call it locally the stone of the pregnant woman, it weighs a thousand tons. It's cleanly cut and separated from the bedrock at the base completely quarried and shaped throughout. Across the road on the other side of the quarry, today being used as a rubbish dump, is another one of these huge blocks. The calculations show that this block weighs 1,250 tons. The German Archaeological Institute has been excavating the site for a century. So it is a comment of some kind that only last June, June 2014, did they discover a third huge block at the quarry. Previously, it had been entirely covered by sediment. And that's this block here. This block, which had been covered by sediment, there's the, I'm standing on it there, there's the front edge of it there. This block, calculations show, weighs 1,460 tons. But the mainstream argues, the Romans did everything. They built the Temple of Jupiter, and they, 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 built, they put those 900-ton megaliths into the western wall. But then, having gone to all the trouble of quarrying out these gigantic blocks in the quarry, they found out they couldn't move them. So they just abandoned them and left them there. To my mind, that is a very un-Roman thing to do. <laughs> Let's buy it. Let's say, OK, they found they couldn't move them. If they found they couldn't move them, the Romans would not have wasted all this work. They would have sliced up these huge blocks like loaves of bread. And they would have used the smaller blocks in the construction of their temple. There's just no way they would have left these in the quarry in this shape with all that work done unless they didn't know they were there. And I think the Romans didn't know they were there, just as the archaeologists didn't know that this block was there until very recently. I think the whole area was deeply covered in sediment. I think the Romans never knew they were there. And I believe we are looking at the fingerprints of a lost civilization. Uh, just a, a curiosity. Stonework of unknown antiquity in the Peruvian Andes, Alakahoyuk in Turkey. Worlds apart, and yet an astonishingly similar design. This uh, curious creature from Putimbo in the Peruvian Andes, and this one from Gobekli Tepe in Turkey. Here's from a, a pillar at Gobekli Tepe, this curious head emerging from the stone and these hands forward like this, a very similar pattern and design is found at Kutimbo in the Peruvian Andes. Uh, this serpent with a very large head and a winding body 
uh, from Gobekli Tepe is so similar to this large-headed serpent from the Peruvian Andes. At Gobekli Tepe, weirdly, a symbol that we would recognize as the letter H appears again and again. And oddly enough, that same H symbol, symbol appears at Tiwanaku uh, in the Andes. Coincidence? Maybe. Easter Island, the statues have arms crooked at the elbow, the fingers meet in front of the belly like this, and Gobekli Tepe, the T-shaped pillars have arms crooked at the elbows, fingers meet in front of the belly, both figures wear a belt. We're told that there can't possibly be any connection between Easter Island and, and Gobekli Tepe, because Gobekli Tepe is 11,600 years old, for sure. That's an established fact. And Easter Island, the statues at Easter Island are thought to be just seven or 800 years old. There is a problem with dating stone monuments. It's a really bad problem, because there is no objective technique for dating when a piece of stone was cut and shaped. We haven't got an excellent technology to do that yet. What archaeologists rely upon is organic material found in juxtaposition to the stone they want to date in such a way that they can feel sure that the stone and the organic material are of the same antiquity. And then they can carbon date the organic material. So let's look at Easter Island um, and these statues, these moai. Almost all of the carbon dates have come out of the platforms on which some of the moai stand. Therefore, the assumption is that the organic material that entered into the masonry of the platforms is of the same age as the statues that are raised upon the platforms. The possibility has not been considered that a later culture may have made those platforms and raised up some of the statues. And actually, if we go behind this very wall, uh, we will see something that archaeologists should be concerned about, which is that an ancient Easter Island head has been used recycled as a block in the wall. And that alone tells us that the Easter Island figures are older than the wall upon which the carbon dating is based. But there's more. If we go to the quarry, the Rano Raraku quarry, it's an extinct volcanic crater, we find it's quite surreal, actually, hundreds of these heads uh, sticking up out of, the, out of the ground. And you know, you might imagine that they are you know, just seated perhaps uh, uh, three or four feet under the ground. But Tor Heyerdahl uh, proved this wrong when he excavated this area in the 1950s and again in the 1980s. Actually, these figures go 30 feet under the ground. And what's covering them up is layer upon layer of natural sedimentation. My good friend, Professor Robert Schock of Boston University, who stuck his neck out over the Sphinx and took a stand that the Great Sphinx of Giza is vastly older than Egyptologists believe. He's been to Easter Island and he's examined this sediment as a geologist. And he makes an excellent point that 30 feet of sedimentation like this on a tiny island like Easter Island cannot form in 700 years. You need thousands and thousands of years to get that level of sedimentation. It was my privilege to know uh, Tor Heyerdahl. He was a a great man, and uh, deeply interested in the possibility of a lost, seafaring global civilization of remote antiquity. And therefore, it's of, it's of interest to look at some ancient maps and compare them with modern features, uh, that, uh, with modern scientific information. This is very recent, actually. This is a 2015 radar survey of Mauritania. And that 2015 radar survey of Mauritania has revealed an ancient, massive river channel here at the time when the Sahara Desert was green. And that's roughly from 12,000 years ago down to 5,000 years ago. After 5,000 years ago, that river vanished completely. So it's extraordinary that we find it on ancient maps in exactly the right place. This is the Canepa map from 1489, but like all the maps I'm going to describe to you, it is based on older source maps, 
now lost. It is documenting a feature that has been unknown to humanity for more than 5,000 years and that flourished 12,000 years ago. The Piri Reis map, of course, is very famous. South America, Africa, and the suggestion of Antarctica down here. But actually, it's this island I want to draw your attention to. This island up here, if you look at it closely, you can see that a row of peculiarly shaped megaliths run right up the middle of it. That island stands in the rough location of the Grand Bahama Banks. And underwater there is the Bimini Road, this megalithic wall, this megalithic road. And it's exactly like the megaliths shown on this island. It suggests that the source map upon the which the Piri Reis map was based was created at a time when this area was above water. And that takes us back thousands and thousands of years in the past. As a matter of fact, Piri Reis tells us in his own handwriting on the map that it was based on more than 100 older source maps. And he speculated that they had come from the lost library of Alexandria, brought from there to Constantinople, where he was, where he was based. Uh, and those source maps were falling apart. They were in such a fragile state that he took it upon himself to preserve the information in them by copying them and making uh, a new map, of which, in fact, only a fragment of his map uh, has survived. And that's the suggestion of Antarctica at the bottom. Let's have another look at Antarctica. Uh, that's Antarctica as it looks today on uh, any modern map. Uh, and here's Antarctica on an honest map drawn in 1800. Why is it an honest map? Because it shows nothing there. Because in 1800, we hadn't yet discovered Antarctica. We didn't discover Antarctica until 1818. So if you made an honest map of the southern hemisphere, you just left a gap where Antarctica was. But again, weirdly, if you go back to older maps based on source maps now lost, Antarctica's all over the place. It's in the right place. It's just larger. There's at the tip of South America, the Orontius Phineas map, 1531. Antarctica, much as it would have looked during the Ice Age. It's on a Mercator map, too, from the 1500s. And uh, here is um, a Ptolemaic map from 1513. And it shows a little island here called High Brazil, High Brazil, uh, lying off the west coast of the island of Ireland. Such an island did not exist in 1513. It does not exist today. But it did exist 12,000 years ago, when sea level was 400 feet lower because of the Ice Age. An island of exactly the right size and exactly the right shape in exactly the right place was there. How come it's documented on this map? The answer, I believe, is the older source maps, going back to a lost civilization uh, upon which the 1400s map was based. There's Japan on the Pisigano chart. There's Japan today. You can see some differences. Uh, Japan today is Honshu, Shikoku, and Kyushu. But here, they're all united into one landmass. The main islands of Japan were united into one landmass 12,400 years ago. And there was an inlet here, exactly as we see the inlet here. And there was an inlet here, exactly as we see the inlet here. Japan is a place of mystery. Japan is filled with stunning megalithic monuments. Here is uh, Masuda no Iwafu. They call it the upside down boat stone. It's perched on a hillside above Asuka, a huge, beautifully cut megalith. And, uh, here is, um, near Kyoto, is uh, beautiful cherry blossom season, by the way, uh, is uh, Ishibutai. They call it the stone stage. In Europe, we would recognize that as a megalithic passage grave. That's what it looks like. The kids playing there. It's a tourist attraction. And that's the interior of it, these giant, giant stones. There are stone circles, megalithic stone circles, all over Japan, um, up here on the island of uh, Hokkaido, here in, in Shikoku. Some of them are quite large. In some cases, they just use river stones, which are placed on the surface to make, to make patterns. And these are thought to be about 4,000 years old. But there's a problem. See, sea level rose 400 feet 
at the end of the ice sheet. As all those ice caps melted into the sea, up went the sea level. And we have very good knowledge of the process of sea level rise. And when something is very deeply buried beneath the sea, you can be sure that it's very, very old. Uh, and the geologists I worked with uh, on this site, which I dived multiple times, uh, this stone circle is 110 feet beneath the waves. Uh, and indeed, it also, as well as large stones, it also has those small river stones uh, on the floor of the sea, just as we saw uh, above water. Uh, there I'm in it uh, for scale. And let's go closer. A central upright surrounded by a spiral of uprights. I'm diving right over the central upright now. Look at the way the outer curve of the central megalith is matched by the inner curve of the megaliths that surround it. There is no way, no way at all, no process by which this could have been created naturally. But archaeology wants it to be natural because a 12,000-year-old megalithic complex in Japan rewrites history. And there's great discomfort with the rewriting of history. Here's Yonaguni, where I did more than 200 dives. Archaeologists say that this is, um, this is entirely natural. The hand of man has not touched it at all. I beg to differ. After 200 dives on the site, I'm absolutely certain it was man-made. Let's move on. The Waltzy Muller world map of 1507 shows a gigantically extended Southeast Asia, a massive Southeast Asian peninsula, almost continent-sized. And that is not how Southeast Asia looked in 1507 or today, but it's very much how Southeast Asia looked at the peak of the last ice age, 21,300 years ago. Let's take a look at what happened to Indonesia between 12,800 and 11,600 years ago, because that's when this massive continent-sized landmass was largely submerged beneath the waves. Geologists call it the Sunda Shelf. It was a very well-watered area. There were beautiful rivers there. It could have been a great home for a civilization. But uh, as the sea levels rose, they ate away the land. And the rivers can now only be traced beneath the ocean. And this is what's left. And when we travel around what left, Santa and I made a, a huge research journey across Indonesia uh, as part of the, the preparation for writing Magicians of the Gods. Uh, and there we find mysterious megalithic cultures everywhere, largely undocumented. They've not even been touched by archaeologists yet. Like this megalithic, again, in Europe, we would see this as a megalithic passage grave and say without hesitation it's five or 6,000 years old. Nobody knows how old it is um, here in South Sumatra. And it's painted, beautifully and richly painted. Here's another painted chamber, uh, very close to that one. And we're rather proud of the bat. I actually screamed <laughs> and, and spoiled Santa's, the rest of Santa's pictures. <laughs> um, Indonesia is constantly rewriting history. 40,000 year old rock art has just been found there, which actually is very similar to the art on those megalithic chambers. I wonder if they're of the, the same age. No longer does Europe have a monopoly on the oldest art in the world. Um, in Indonesia, not so long ago, was discovered a previously unknown species of human being who coexisted with us, Homo floresiensis. They call him the Hobbit, because he was about three feet tall, became extinct some 12,000 years ago. Uh, there's that Pleistocene cave art. Uh, and here, really intriguing, a, a shell with geometric patterns carved upon it, which were thought to have been only possible um, uh, only anatomically modern humans could have made them with the modern human brain. The, the, the Homo erectus from half a million years ago is not supposed to have had such capacities. And yet, that shell is half a million years old, and it bears the marks of an intelligent hand. Mandum, 
on the island of Java, three hours west, the site of Gunung Padang. Gunung Padang, like Gobekli Tepe in, Indonesia, in uh, Turkey, is rewriting history. Um, Gunung Padang has been a known archaeological site since about 1914, when this was discovered. These are actually columnar basalt, which forms naturally, but they have been used as a construction block here. And they're not thought to be particularly old. This site is thought to be about 2,500 uh, years old. There are some of the terraces at the top where the limited dating that's been done gives dates of about 2,500 years old. But the gentleman I'm with here is Dr. Danny Hillman Natawijaja. Uh, he is Indonesia's uh, leading geological expert in megathrust earthquakes. And he also has a deep interest in history. And when he went to Gunung Padang and took a look at this site, he wasn't satisfied uh, with the dating that was given to it, indeed with the whole story of the site. Uh, he wanted to look down underneath, see what's underneath this stuff. Uh, and this is how it, it looks. Kind of pyramidal looking hill. And uh, Danny was intrigued by it. It's about 100 meters high. Uh, so he assembled a team, a geological team, uh, who applied the latest scientific methods to understand what is inside that structure. They were, they were all over it with remote sensing, with surface geology, archaeology, geomagnetic survey, ground penetrating radar, electrical resistivity, seismic tomography, drill core sampling, petrology, carbon dating, architectural analysis, etc. They really worked this site. They worked it in great depth. They used drills to drill down into it. And those drills going down as much as 300 feet began to pull up bits of worked stone associated with organic material that could be dated. And the datings, initially not controversial, as we go further down, they get older and older and older. Yes, 2,500 at the top, but then we get into vastly ancient dates, dates remotely ancient, deep in the last ice age, which add to the intrigue of this extraordinary site. And lo and behold, the remote sensing has identified chambers within the site, large, regular spaces, uh, which can only be chambers. In fact, three of them have been identified in the whole complex. Uh, Santa and I and, and uh, Professor Robert Schock from Boston University uh, went to Gunung Padang uh, together in December 2013, and, and Danny showed us his, his geological evidence that this is entirely a man-made structure and that the megalithic site on the top is just the latest addition to a very, very, very ancient site. By the way, Gunung Padang in the Indonesian language means mountain field, which doesn't sound like much. But in the Sundanese language, which is spoken locally, it means mountain of enlightenment. And there is a tradition attaching to this place that it goes back to the remotest antiquity, and it is still held sacred by the local inhabitants. Schock was absolutely intrigued as a geologist with Danny's discovery, and he, like I, uh, uh, is convinced that we're dealing with a, a deeply anomalous man-made structure which has the potential to rewrite history, and we would really like to know what's inside those chambers. And so would Danny. The trouble is that archaeologists in Indonesia got together and stopped Danny's work. They said, you're just a geologist, and we want your budget. And they campaigned with the political authorities, and he was stopped working for the best part of a year. But Danny is an operator, and he eventually took the case to the then president of Indonesia, uh, President uh, Susilo Bambang Yudhoyono. He brought him to the site. He showed him everything that he showed me in shock. And the president was deeply impressed. And he said, you mean the archaeologists are stopping you excavating this site? And he said, yeah. So the president said, well, they're not going to stop you any longer. Get on with it. Excavate it. It took some months to get the excavation together, but they started in August 2014. And in October 2014, um, Danny wrote to me uh, that the research progress has been great. 
We've excavated three more spots right on the top of the megalithic site in the past couple of weeks, which give more evidence and details about the buried structures. We've uncovered lots more stone artifacts from the excavations. The existence of the pyramid-like structure beneath the megalithic site is now loud and clear. Even for non-specialists, it is not too difficult to understand if they come and see for themselves. We found some kind of open hole buried by soil five to seven meters thick. However, we've not yet got into the main chamber. We are now drilling to the suspected location of the chamber based on subsurface geophysic in the middle of the megalithic site. That was the 2nd of October, 2014. And then something unfortunate happened. Indonesia had a change of president. On the 10th of October, President Joko Widodo took over. He does look a lot like Barack Obama, doesn't he? <laughs> he took over. He listened to the nagging complaints of the archaeologists who believed that this was their territory and who were jealous of Danny's budget. And uh, he stopped the excavation again. And the excavation is still stopped to this day. Uh, I spoke to Danny again just uh, about 10 days ago, and that's the position. They're still not moving ahead. But he's optimistic with public pressure from around the world that they will be able to continue uh, with this excavation before too long and that the truth will come out. So there's the Ice Age Indonesia. There's an artist's impression of what Gunung Padang would have liked, looked like originally. And Danny's saying, it's older than 9,000 years. It could be more than 20,000 years. It's a strong case, but not an easy case. We're up against the world's belief. So why, you may ask, am I showing you pictures of dinosaurs and chickens? and some kind of shrew, and Leonardo da Vinci's Vitruvian man. OK, 65 million years ago, these guys ran the planet. OK, but something bad happened to them, and they devolved into chickens. <laughs> Meanwhile, 65 million years ago, this little shrew-like creature was scuttling around in a state of deep fear. The clearing of the dinosaurs out, out of the way allowed that little shrew, that little proto-mammal, to begin the process of evolution. I like the cartoon, the Jurassic games, mammals versus dinosaurs. Get smaller, Larry, small, small. So there's our 65 million year old mother. The whole story of mammalian evolution took off then after the extinction of the dinosaurs. So these extinction level events are world changers. They change the game completely. They change everything. They are hugely significant. As perhaps these astonished looking dinosaurs realized, as they saw a gigantic space rock whizzing in at 70,000 miles an hour, a rock 10 kilometers in diameter. But today, it's fully accepted that the dinosaurs were made extinct by a cosmic impact. Uh, general view is that it was an asteroid, uh, but the evidence is equally strong that it may have been a comet. Whatever it was, it came in from outer space very fast, and it hit the Earth a devastating blow. It set wildfires ablaze around the planet. It changed climate, and it led to the extinction of the dinosaurs. And it left a very distinct layer in the soil. That is called the Cretaceous Tertiary Boundary, which, when investigated, proved to contain certain distinct chemical products that can only be the result of a cosmic impact, of a big space rock hitting the Earth. Tremendous heat, shock of the impact, create nanodiamonds. Uh, impact spherules, carbon spherules, um, melt glass like trinitite that we find from the nuclear, the first nuclear explosions. The heat of a nuclear blast is similar to the heat of, uh, generated by these, uh, these, these impacts. In fact, um, it, it, evidence of, of, of temperatures in excess of 2,200 degrees centigrade across a large area of the Earth's surface. That, by the way, is the boiling point of quartz. These are all called impact proxies. They show you what happened 
that there was a cosmic impact. But when the extinction of the dinosaurs by cosmic impact was originally proposed by this father-son team, Lewis and Walter Alvarez, they were subjected to the most vile and vicious attacks by their colleagues. They were accused of sensationalism, of fantasy. Of course, the dinosaurs were not made extinct by a space rock. It was considered to be very politically incorrect to suggest such a thing. Um, there is a, a strong theme in geology that's called uniformitarianism. It's a kind of ideology. It's a belief system, not really a set of facts. The whole huge number of, of geologists would like to believe that the processes as we observe them today on the Earth are a pretty good guide to how they've been in the past. So something shocking and catastrophic like this goes against that dogma. Uh, for 10 years, they put up with the most horrible attacks until they found the crater. And they found the crater in the Gulf of Mexico. And that settled the argument. After that, it became clear that Lewis and Walter Alvarez had been right all along that the story they had first based entirely on impact proxies was true, that the dinosaurs were made extinct by a cosmic impact. NASA has taken all this into account now. It accepts that extinction level events do happen. But here's the nice news NASA brings us. Extinction level events only occur once every 100 million years. How nice of the universe to be so exact, so Germanic in its timekeeping. Once every 100 million years. That means we have nothing to worry about, and these things have nothing to do with the human story. But many scientists do not agree with the NASA position. They include the late, great Sir Fred Hoyle, Chandra Wickram Singh, Victor Klub, and Bill Napier. Uh, they have warned that our cosmic environment may, may be much more active than NASA believes, and their concern particularly is with comets. And they point to the ancient worldwide fear of comets. This is truly universal. It's found in all cultures. Comets in the mythology of the world were never good news. They were always bad news. They were considered to be world-destroying agents. And the astronomers I've just indicated feel very strongly that such a powerful mythology coming down all around the world cannot just be fantasy. It must be based on some memory of our species, something that happened. Here's a NASA fact sheet. They're telling us what a meteor shower is. We've quite recently been through a big meteor shower called the Torrid Meteor Stream. Anybody know that? Anybody see the Halloween fireworks? A meteor shower is actually, and there are hundreds of them, a meteor shower is actually the debris stream left by a fragmented comet. Comets are big hunks of rock bound together by ice, and they tend to break up into multiple fragments, and those fragments can bang against each other. And gradually, around the orbit of the original comet, you get spread out a trail of debris that orbits along that original orbit. And NASA says, Look, don't worry about this. The meteorites are usually small, dust particle, boulder size at the most. Mostly they burn up in the atmosphere, just a pretty sound and light show. Um, nothing to worry about. A number of astronomers absolutely do not agree, particularly Victor Klub and Bill Napier. And I recommend their excellent work, The Cosmic Serpent and The Cosmic Winter, which demonstrates that the meteor stream that we call the Taurid meteor stream, because it appears to emanate, it appears to come out of the constellation of Taurus. That's an optical illusion, but that's just the area of the sky that the radiant is in. Uh, that the Taurid meteor stream is the debris trail of a fragmented giant comet. Actually, we pass through the Taurid meteor stream twice a year. We pass through it in the end of June, and we pass through it again in November, twice a year. And the last recorded impact that we have had from an object in the Taurid meteor stream was actually quite recently. It was on the 30th of June, 1908. And it happened, fortunately, over an uninhabited area of Siberia. Uh, it's called the Tunguska event. 
It was an object calculated to be between 60 meters and 190 meters in diameter. It didn't even reach the ground. It blew up five or six kilometers above the ground. It was an airburst. It flattened 80 million trees across an area of 2,000 square kilometers, which is larger than the city of London. If this event had happened over an area of major population, we would all be very concerned about the torrid meteor stream today. But fortunately, it happened over an uninhabited area, and there were very few fatalities. A graphic of the torrid meteor stream. We pass through it twice a year. The torrid meteor stream is 30 million kilometers wide. The Earth orbits at the rate of 2.5 million kilometers a day. It takes us 12 days to make the passage through the torrid meteor stream. Sure, there's a lot of dust and little rocky things in there, but there's also some very big known objects in there, including Comet Enki, which is a fragment of the original giant comet that made up this meteor stream, Olgiato, Rudniki, and 19 of the brightest near-Earth objects. There are filaments within the stream that are just harmless dust, and there are other filaments that are full of large, rocky debris. I liken it a little bit to strapping on a blindfold uh, twice a year and crossing a six-lane highway uh, and hoping there's no traffic. And if there is, let it be motorcycles, not trucks. Well, we've all witnessed the, at least those of us who were alert and aware in 1994, have witnessed the fragmentation of a comet. That's Comet Shoemaker-Levy 9. It's exhibiting behavior typical of comets. Uh, broke up into multiple fragments as it was drawn in by the colossal gravity of Jupiter. And that gravitational power of Jupiter was so immense that it just sucked that comet out of the sky. All its bits came raining down on Jupiter. That was a small comet. It was just two kilometers in diameter. It broke up into about 20 fragments. The total explosive power of these impacts was 300 gigatons. A gigaton is equivalent to 1 billion tons of TNT. The stockpiled nuclear arsenal of the entire Earth, were it to explode at once, would be equivalent to just 6.4 gigatons. So this is the moment to say, thank you, Jupiter. <laughs> thank you for being the giant guardian of our planet, for circling out there in the outer solar system with your huge gravity and drawing in most of the comets that would threaten life on Earth. Again and again, Jupiter takes one for the team. <laughs> but every now and then, a comet does get through. Let's look at this story a little further. There's our galaxy, the Milky Way. There's a huge black hole at the heart of the Milky Way, the center of the Milky Way, the galactic bulge. And there's our sun and the solar system, and we're in orbit around the Milky Way. And that's a vast orbit, and it takes hundreds and hundreds of millions of years to complete. And we do not orbit always in the plane of the galaxy. The sun and the solar system dive up and down through the plane of the galaxy at roughly 30 million year intervals. And when they cross the plane of the galaxy, Gravitational disturbances are set, at, uh, are set loose uh, in, much, uh, in very distant areas of the solar system, right on the edge of the solar system. The Kuiper belt and the Oort cloud, which are sources of comets. The Oort cloud uh, is calculated to contain a trillion comets. And it's the gravitational disturbances of the sun's orbit around the center of the galaxy that occasionally send one of those big things winging in towards the inner solar system where we better pray that Jupiter or Saturn catch it before it reaches the Earth. Because comets are not just dirty snowballs. Comets, as I said, are chunks of rock bound together by ice. This is the nucleus of um, Comet 67P, photographed by the Rosetta probe. Uh, it's five kilometers in diameter. The giant comets, they can reach up to two ki 200 kilometers in diameter. Let's scale 67p up to just 30 kilometers in diameter. And that's what it would look like over the city of Los Angeles. 
This is a paper in the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society, published in July 2010 by Bill Napier, Napier who's the professor of astrobiology at Cardiff University. The evidence, decades old now, and not even controversial amongst the comet community, is that an exceptionally large, low inclination, short period comet has been orbiting in our neighborhood for about 20,000 years. In such a disintegrating environment, there is a reasonable probability of a catastrophic encounter with debris in the comet trail. And what Bill Napier is doing here is he's connecting the astronomical work of his own astronomical work and his colleagues' astronomical work to a totally different field of work, work that's been carried out by Earth scientists over the last decade uh, who have um, identified um, a cosmic impact 12,800, 12,900 years ago. And what he's saying is that it's, it's very clear when you do the calculations that the, the, the giant comet that created the torrid meteor stream was responsible for the impacts that this other team have identified. And until then, both teams weren't comparing notes. The astronomers were looking at the sky. The Earth scientists were looking at the ground. And here are the Earth scientists, some of them. It's a team of more than 30 of them, actually. James Kennett, who's a marine geologist, professor at the University of California, Santa Barbara, is a world-renowned expert in paleo-oceanography. Richard Firestone, staff scientist at the Nuclear Science Division. Lawrence Berkeley, laboratory. James Whitke uh, is a geologist. Albert Goodyear is an archaeologist. Um, they're they're a, a huge team of them. Uh, and they have um, been looking at a mystery. They started by looking at a mystery. And to understand the mystery that motivated their work, uh, we need to understand how the world was at the end of the last ice age, at, during the ice age. There were ice caps three kilometers deep, sitting on top of the northern half of North America and the northern half of Northern Europe. And as a result, sea level was 400 feet lower than it is today, and huge areas of land were exposed that are not exposed today. Last glacial maximum about 21,000 years ago. Then, politely and in a rather politically correct way, the world began to slowly and gently warm up, and the ice sheets began to gradually ablate. By 12,800 years ago, there were still masses of ice over North America and Northern Europe, but it was about two kilometers deep, not three kilometers deep. Climate was getting warmer, and then suddenly, there was a dramatic plunge in climate, bringing the world as cold as it had been at the coldest point of the Ice Age. And that plunge in climate, that sudden radical deep freeze, lasted for 1,200 years, from 12,800 years ago to 11,600 years ago. It was a global cataclysm. And the whole story of human civilization, as it's taught to us, supposedly unfolds immediately after it. This should raise some questions in our minds, particularly when we discover that that exact same period coincides with a massive spike in animal extinctions, the megafaunas, the mammoths, the woolly rhinos. That's when they go down. And the epicenter of this cataclysm was North America. That's where the extinctions were most profound. But it was a global cataclysm. Limited regional, regional explanations no longer suffice. Those mega mammals were not killed by voracious hunter-gatherers with spears. Something else was going on. And that something else was a cosmic impact. Because exactly the same impact proxies that were used to identify the cosmic impact that made the dinosaurs extinct turn up in a distinct layer of soil 12,800 years ago. These impact proxies, and they're all over the world. And I'm just going to show you, without asking you to read them or reading them to you myself, that simply because I want to emphasize how deep the science is and how thorough and detailed it is, this science has all been published in mainstream professional journals. The scientists who've put this case forward for the Younger Dryas impact, uh, that period of 1,200 years is called the Younger Dryas, by the way, have, like Lewis and Walter Alvarez, been subjected to repeated vicious attacks by their colleagues who are committed to the notion of uniformitarianism. But they have handled it like gentlemen. Every attack has been systematically and carefully refuted. Every criticism has been shown to be incorrect, and they've continued to come up with new evidence. This is the first paper from the 9th of October, 2007, evidence for an extraterrestrial impact 12,900 years ago that contributed to the megafaunal extinctions and the Younger Dryas cooling. 
Since then, they've revised the date down 100 years to 12,800 years ago. Uh, here's another paper. Shock synthesized his hexagonal diamonds in younger Dryas boundary sediments. Can only be caused by cosmic impacts. Um, evidence for deposition of 10 million tons of impact spherules across four continents 12,800 years ago. Very high temperature impact melt products 12,900. Evidence from Mexico, evidence from the Greenland ice cores. September 2014, Journal of Geology. Nanodiamond rich layer across three continents consistent with major con cosmic impact at 12,800 years before the present. And the latest paper, it's a ghastly title, Bayesian Chronological Analysis. I can hardly say that. Uh, what it means is a, st a statistical analysis of the evidence of this event from all over the world. And what they found is that that evidence 12,800 years ago was not laid down over 100 or 200 or 300 years. That evidence was laid down in a single afternoon, 12,800 years ago, across 50 million square kilometers of the Earth's surface. And the epicenter was here in North America. There were further impacts on the northern European ice cap. The impacts were on the North American ice cap, on the northern European ice cap, ice cap and indeed as far east as Syria. As I said, the scientists who put this forward have had to defend their work, and they have defended it vigorously and professionally with incredible effect. And very recently, just like Lewis and Walter Alvarez, they have started to find the craters. Craters in areas that were not covered by ice. But the main impacts were on the ice cap. And that's why the craters have been difficult to find, because they were excavated in two kilometer deep ice. The ice melted away. The evidence for the crater was largely gone, except for shock effects beneath the ground. And here are the recognized craters, and more are being found. Corosol, Charity Shoal featured the Bloody Creek, Creek structure, and so on and so forth. So the case is as good as it can get. It's as strong as it can get. 12,800 years ago, multiple fragments of a giant comet impacted the Earth. At least four of the fragments were objects in the range of two kilometers in diameter. Impacts were concentrated on the North American ice cap, but the resulting climate disaster was worldwide. Why did the world get suddenly cold at the beginning of the Younger Dryas 12,800 years ago? Because the impacts on the ice cap sent a flood of icy meltwater into the Atlantic Ocean. And there it interrupted the Gulf Stream, which is part of the global central heating system of our planet. And that's why the world plunged into that mysterious deep freeze. But water also ran south. Flooding ran south across the North American continent, scarring the land in areas that we can all visit and explore. And I made a huge research trip uh, across the channeled scablands of the Pacific Northwest with, with my friend and colleague Randall Carson last year. Uh, actually, nobody today disputes that these channeled scablands uh, were shaped by immense floods around 12,800 years ago. And indeed, these floods were anomalous, because that's a period when the world suddenly gets cold. You'd expect to see flooding when the world is getting warm. Um, but it's accepted that there were floods. But for it to be accepted that there were floods took a very long time. And I want to pay tribute to a great American geologist who lived from the year 1882 to the year 1981. And his name was J. Harlan Brett. He was quite a cranky guy. His, his first name actually was J. And he used to get really annoyed with proofreaders when they kept putting full points after it. Um, he, we can see J. Harlan Brett, he's got a, a plaque up for him now. Uh, who patiently taught us that catastrophic floods may sometimes play a role in nature's unfolding drama. And Brett said, ideas without precedent are generally looked upon with disfavor, and men are shocked if their conceptions of an orderly world are challenged. J. Harlan Brett was a field geologist. He walked the walk for decades across the southern edge of the former ice cap, looking at the landscape. And he knew as a geologist that he was looking at evidence for cataclysmic flooding. He didn't know what the source of the flooding was, and he didn't care. What he was looking at was the features on the ground. And those features declared loud and clear flood, massive, humongous, single flood that rose and fell within two weeks. 
His colleagues exiled him to the outer darkness. He was hardly spoken to at all for 20 years. He was ridiculed, he was humiliated, but he stuck by his guns. And eventually, it was recognized that he had been right all along. And he was awarded the Penrose Medal in 1979, the, the, the most prestigious award in the field of geology. He was 96 years old then. And he said to his son, all my enemies are dead, so I have no one to gloat over. <laughs> he had to accept a compromise in the end to get his flooding evidence accepted. He had to agree to a source for the, for the water. And what was being proposed and what therefore was able to fit into a comfortable gradualistic model was that the source of the water had been a glacial lake, glacial lake Missoula, uh, which had broken its ice dam and spilled out and scarred the landscape uh, over, over here. Now, the problem is that the water in glacial lake Missoula was nowhere near sufficient enough to cause this massive amount of flooding. So then the argument was that maybe there were eight or 10 or, or, or 20 floods. Geologists are now saying there were, maybe there were 80 floods to cause all of that. And Harlan Bratz was never comfortable with that. He always felt the evidence on the, on the ground spoke of a flood that has risen and fallen within two weeks. But he compromised and he said, okay, if you say it was Glacial Lake Missoula, it was Glacial Lake Missoula. I don't think uh, that Harlan Bretz would have compromised if he had lived to see the evidence that the North American ice cap was hit 12,800 years ago by several large fragments of a comet. Uh, I think he would have abandoned Glacial Lake Missoula and returned to the original conclusion of his field research that there'd been a single humongous flood. The, the comet provides the hitherto missing heat source to account for the sudden melting of a sufficiently vast area of the ice cap. This is Dry Falls. It's in the middle of Upper and Lower Grand Coulee in Washington State. Uh, and this is what it looks like from under just a part of the Dry Falls, this fossilized waterfall. Uh, I'm there with Randall Carlson, a great catastrophist researcher who really opened my eyes to the meaning of what is there on the landscape. I kind of see him as a sort of reincarnation of J. Harlan Bretz, actually. And uh, here are Randall and I uh, standing overlooking Dry Falls. This huge waterfall can be put into perspective when we put Niagara Falls into the picture. There's the enormous waterfall of Dry Falls, and that's Niagara Falls. But Niagara Falls is the result of 12,000 years of work of the river, and Dry Falls is the result of a humongous two-week flood. And that flood was highly erosive. It was jostling with icebergs that had come off the ice cap. Uh, whole forests had been ripped up by their roots. There was rubble and boulder and mud in it. It was a very abrasive agent, and it cut these falls, and then subsided, and the falls were left as a fossil. We're above the town of Wenatchee here. That's Wenatchee down in the valley floor, 500 feet below us, and perched on the valley side, a humongous boulder made of basalt. What's it doing there? It doesn't come from there. It comes from about 100 miles away. Uh, and that uh, boulder uh, actually weighs, calculations show it weighs 18,000 tons. How did an 18,000 ton boulder get 500 feet on, up on a valley side above Wenatchee? The answer is it was carried there in an iceberg the size of an oil tanker. Glaciation does this. Glacial sheets snatch up and enchain rocks, and they then drop them uh, when they move. They're called glacial erratics. The thing is, there's thousands of these giant boulders all over the Pacific Northwest, thousands and thousands of them up to very high altitudes, each one weighing between 10,000 and 18,000 tons. Every one of them carried in a huge iceberg and dumped when the flood receded. Testimony to the nature of the cataclysm that took place. This is Camas Prairie. See the rippled land? Those are actually current ripples, like the current ripples you get on a beach as the seawater recedes, except in this case, as you can see from the vehicle, they're about 50 feet high and 300 feet long. And here are the channeled scablands, uh, a complete mess, scablands, because the flood plucked and tore at the landscape. Uh, I've been concentrating on this area, but the evidence goes all the way across the southern tip of the former ice cap. The St. Croix River in Minnesota 
these gigantic potholes were created by the same flooding. And new evidence indicates that the Finger Lakes of New York State were not made by glaciers. They were also carved and cut by those horrendous floods coming off the ice cap. Why did it get warm suddenly at the end of the Younger Dryas? Long ago, Sir Fred Hoyle uh, was intrigued by the mystery of the Younger Dryas, and he proposed the solution that what would have caused that warming would have been a comet impact, in this case, another fragment of the same comet that hit the Earth 12,800 years ago, a comet impact in ocean. And the effect of a comet impact in ocean, as well as enormous floods, huge tidal waves, is to throw a vast cloud of water vapor into the upper atmosphere and enshroud the Earth in water vapor. And that creates a greenhouse effect, which accounts for the radical warming at the end of the Younger Dryas. The science on the end of the Younger Dryas is not as good as the science on the beginning of the Younger Dryas. That's speculation at the moment that it was an impact in water 11,600 years ago. But it makes sense. Um, it's, definitely, uh, it, it's definitely a contender. And what's sure at any rate is that the Younger Dryas did end abruptly 11,600 years ago. Global temperatures soared, and the remaining ice caps very rapidly collapsed into the sea, causing a dramatic pulse of sea level rise. And that dramatic pulse of sea level rise is known by geologists as meltwater pulse 1b, exactly 11,600 years ago. And lo and behold, it turns out to coincide also exactly with Plato's date for the destruction and submergence of Atlantis. Archaeologists don't like the word Atlantis. <laughs> It really upsets them, and they make up lots of insults. So those of us who are even prepared to talk about Atlantis, they call us, you know, Atlantologists, like it's some kind of thing. It, it, in, the, in their lexicon, uh, the only thing lower than an Atlantologist is a pyramidion. <laughs> Plato spoke of Atlantis as a great advanced civilization that had once been spiritually pure that was kind and, 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 and generous and imbued with goodness. But as time went by, it became arrogant and cruel, and it began to impose its power upon others. And it became deeply materialistic and, and, and locked in, in negative behavior. A ringing phrase, it ceased to wear its prosperity with moderation. And then the universe slapped it down. Plato precedes his account with uh, a description of a cosmic event, of a cosmic impact. Um, and he tells us that the destruction of Atlantis was such a huge thing that mankind actually had to begin again like children with no memory of what went before. Where did the story come from? It came from ancient Egypt. Plato's ancestor, Solon, the famous Greek lawmaker, had visited Egypt during his lifetime in 600 BC. He lived 150 years or so before Plato. He'd visited it in 600 BC, and he'd been told by the priests of the Temple of Neith at Sais in the Delta the story of Atlantis. And they'd pointed to texts written on their walls. That temple, unfortunately, no longer exists, uh, where the story of Atlantis was written. And when Solon asked when this had happened, the priest replied, 9,000 years ago. This was in 600 BC. 9,600 BC is 11,600 years ago from our time today. It's exactly the moment of that second spike of cataclysm, meltwater pulse 1B, the rising sea levels, rapidly rising sea levels. Archaeologists accuse Plato of making the whole thing up. But if he made it up, he was astonishingly on the money with the latest, latest science about global flooding 11,600 years ago. Egyptologists will tell you there is no uh, mention of Atlantis in any ancient Egyptian annal. And that is true. There is no mention of Atlantis. But is there a mention of an advanced civilization that lived upon an island that was destroyed in a flooding cataclysm? Yes, absolutely. And that is found on the walls of the Temple of Horus at Edfu. The Temple of Horus at Edfu is a relatively young temple. It's a Ptolemaic temple. It dates from 300 BC, but it was built on the site of an older temple, which it turns out was built on the site of an even older temple, and you can receive this backwards distantly into the remote past. And the Temple of Horus at Edfu inherited the archive of the former temples. And that archive 
rather reminiscent of the story of the maps, that archive included material written on animal skins which was so fragile, so falling apart, that they feared for its preservation. And they sought to preserve it by copying extracts and carving them deeply into the walls of this temple. Uh, for example, between the inner and outer enclosure walls. They're called the Edfu building texts, and this is what they look like. And this, cutting a long story short, uh, is the story they tell. Uh, they speak of a homeland of the primeval ones. It was an island, and it was destroyed in a great flood. And they tell how the primeval ones, the gods, came to Egypt and established religion by building primeval mounds up and down the land. They refer to a, a snake called the Great Leaping One. As soon as I hear that language, I'm reminded of the way that comets are always referred to as serpents, like Victor Kloop's cosmic, cosmic serpent. The, the, the great leaping one is described as a chief enemy of the god. His assault causes the homeland of the primeval ones to be swallowed up by the sea, but first the island was pierced and the domain was split. The Edfu texts make it clear that there were survivors of the primeval island of the gods, that these people were navigators, they were seafarers. Some of them were at sea at the time. They made their way back to the site of their former homeland, their island, and they discovered it lost beneath the waves. And instead of an island, the sea was filled with mud. This is a very curious echo of the Atlantis story, because as Plato's account has it, when Atlantis went down, the sea was left filled with mud, so much mud that navigation was difficult through it. These survivors uh, began a project to reconstitute or reincarnate or reinstate the former world of the gods. And they set about wandering the world. And this project was pursued not only in Egypt, but in many other lands. That's why it's interesting that 11,600 years ago, before the present, is also the date now being given by archaeology, who are scrambling to catch up with the discovery at Gobekli Tepe, now being given by archaeology for, quote, the invention of megalithic architecture and agriculture at Gobekli Tepe. Gobekli Tepe is in Turkey, and uh, here's what the site looks like. And this is the archaeological fairy tale, okay? We know that the, the inhabitants of that area 11,600 years ago were hunter-gatherers. Archaeologists say that a group of hunter-gatherers must have woken up one morning, <laughs> magically inspired, to build actually what turns out be the largest megalithic site that has ever been created anywhere on Earth. Not only were they inspired to do so, but they were equipped with all the knowledge and skills necessary to carry out the task. Suddenly, they had specialists who knew how to cut and carve stone. They had others who could organize a labor force of several hundreds and bring them to a site with no water and feed and water them as the megaliths were put into place. They had astronomers who could line these structures up to certain stellar events with, uh, with very high precision. Uh, and just uh, as well as this incredible inspiration, um, just on the side, they decided to invent agriculture as well. Because 11,600 years ago, exactly in the locus of Gobekli Tepe, we find agriculture spreading all over Turkey, where previously it had not been, had not been present. I think this is a complete nonsense theory that archaeology is giving us. Sorry. You know, I don't think we're looking at a sudden, mysteriously precocious invention 7,000 years ahead of its time, because this site is 7,000 years older than Stonehenge. You know, uh, we, it, what it looks like to me is more like a transfer of technology from the survivors of a lost civilization who already knew how to work megaliths on grand scale and who already fully understood agriculture. Some of the blocks at Gobekli Tepe weigh 50 tons. This one never left the quarry because they found a, a fault in it, but you can see the T-shaped profile there, classic T-shaped pillar of Gobekli Tepe. Most of the megaliths weigh about 20 tons, uh, and many of them are uh, richly carved. Uh, for example, pillar 43 in enclosure D, uh, astonishing work of art. I'm going to have more to say about that uh, later. Uh, here I am with Professor Klaus Schmidt of the German Archaeological Institute, the discoverer and excavator of Gobekli Tepe. His excavations began in the second half of the 1990s. Sadly, Klaus passed away last year. Uh, my first encounter with him was in 2013. Normally, when I turn up on uh, archaeological sites, 
the archaeologists make the sign of the, the cross, you know, like Dracula has appeared. <laughs> they will not invite me a, across the threshold. Uh, Kleinschmidt was different. He was very generous. He was very kind. He knew exactly who I was. And he said, look, I'm going to show you around, and I'll tell you what I know. And he actually spent three days showing me around the site in detail. And I want to pay tribute to him for that. That was a great thing. Many archaeologists wouldn't even speak to me. <laughs> and I'm very, I'm very sad that Klaus passed away from a heart attack in the, in the summer of 2014, because he was doing incredible work at Gobekli Tepe. And that site has been left somewhat leaderless since then. He's pointing vehemently at the ground because he's telling me something. He's telling me that the area they have excavated so far is only a tiny proportion of the whole site. At least 50 times as much still lies under the ground. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of giant megalithic pillars deeply buried. The other thing he's telling me is, take a look at this stuff that they've excavated this pillar from. This is not natural sediment. This is deliberate burial. This site was deliberately buried like a time capsule by the people who made it. It ran for about 1,200 years from 11,600 years ago, and then they shut it down. And they deliberately buried it, teams of people, hundreds of them, with buckets and rubble, pouring it in over them, covering the whole site, hiding it from view. And thereafter, for more than 10,000 years, nobody saw it again. And that's why we can be so sure of the dating. There's no possibility of the introduction of falsely young organic material by later cultures. This is a sealed site. It's not alone. Uh, another site at Karahan Tepe, about 50, 60 miles away, has been found, not yet even been excavated. Dates to the same period. And in fact, whenever we find a really sealed site where we can be absolutely sure of the dating, like this huge megalith at the bottom of the Sicily Channel, which was published only in September 2014, because of sea level rise, we know this 12 meter long megalith has been underwater for at least nine and a half thousand years. Therefore, it's at least nine and a half thousand years old, and possibly it was standing there a thousand or two thousand years before that. No possibility of a falsely young date there, just as at Gobekli Tepe. I think Gobekli Tepe is going to require us to reconsider the dates of megalithic sites all over the world, as a matter of fact. Uh, for example, these T-shaped megaliths of Menorca are said to be only 4,000 years old, but I think that's a falsely young date. They look a lot like the Gobekli Tepe megalith to me. Uh, and uh, the general appearance of Gobekli Tepe is astonishingly like the general appearance of the megalithic temples of Malta which again are said to be about 5,000 years old, but which again have suffered from the introduction of falsely young organic material giving a falsely young date. Go to the hypogeum uh, in Malta, carved out deep, uh, deep beneath the earth, uh, and, and compare it, its three levels, with the so-called subterranean cities of Turkey, like uh, Derinkuyu. Um, there is uh, Derinkuyu, and, and there is the hypogeum uh, in, in, in Malta. Now, the general view is that the Derinkuyu subterranean cities and the others in Turkey m m might date back as far as 800 BC, but not older than that. The hypogeum is thought to date to about 5,000 years old, but not older than that. But how secure actually are these datings when we're dealing with stuff that's cut and carved out of solid rock? How much can we rely on carbon dating from organic material found in association with it? There's a grubby story around the hypogeum. Red ochre paintings were found on the walls and the ceilings. They look a lot like upper Paleolithic cave art, as a matter of fact, more than 12,000 years old. And amongst them was found a painting of a hybrid creature, a bison bull, which is a classic piece of upper Paleolithic cave art, therefore suggesting that the hypogeum might be more than 12,000 years old. The director of the National Museums of Malta solved the problem by having the bison bull scrubbed off the walls of the hypogeum. Scrubbed off the walls. We don't like this new evidence. Let's just get rid of it. The man who exposed the scandal is Dr. Anton Mifsud. He's the, the chief uh, head pediatrician at the main hospital in Valletta. And he's also a very dedicated amateur archaeologist. He exposed the scandal of the bison bull. And he and I are sitting in the so-called cart ruts of Malta. I have to say, some cart, some rut. 
These Carteruts are thought to date to the megalithic period, a bit younger, maybe about 4,000 years old, but the problem is that the Carteruts drop right off the edge of cliffs and continue under the sea, down to depths of 120 feet beneath the sea, where we can be quite sure that they're at least 12,000 years old, which must bring us briefly to the Great Sphinx of Giza a classic megalithic site with its megalithic sites in front of it. And the work of my friends and colleagues, John Anthony West and Professor Robert Schock of Boston University. Back in 1992, West was the first person onto the precipitation-induced weathering of the Sphinx. And he brought Robert Schock to Giza as a geologist to really take a look at the Sphinx. And, and Schock, a courageous man, when he, when he, when he, he knows his weathering, and he stuck his neck out, knowing that he would be attacked by scientific colleagues, and knowing that he would be attacked by Egyptologists. And he said, there's no way that the Great Sphinx of Giza was created in 2500 BC, which is the Egyptological story. No way it was created then, because it was, at some point in its career, subjected to about 1,000 years of extremely heavy rainfall. And you do not get rainfall like that at Giza in the last 5,000 years. You actually have to go back to the Younger Dryas to get that kind of climate in the Sahara. At the time, Egyptologists were saying, rubbish. We know the Sphinx is just 4,500 years old. It can't possibly be 12,000 years old. There isn't any other megalithic site in the world which is 12,000 years old. And uh, if there was a culture capable of creating the Great Sphinx, surely they would have created other monuments. Well, that was in 1992. But since then, we've found Gobekli Tepe. And if you can make Gobekli Tepe, you can certainly make the Sphinx. So the fingerprints of a lost civilization just keep on coming out of the woodwork. Um, if you asked any ancient Egyptian where the knowledge and science manifested in the monuments of the Giza Plateau originated, they would have said it came down from the time of the gods, from Zep Tepi, the first time, and that it was a gift of the gods. So are there any clues as to when this, uh, this remotely ancient first time was? Geology is already saying more than 12,000 years ago. And so it turns out does the astronomy of the plateau as a whole. But if we're going to unlock these deeper mysteries of we have to have a, a basic knowledge of a hard-to-observe astronomical phenomenon called the precession of the equinoxes, which is particularly observable uh, at the four key moments of the year, recognized as the key moments of the year throughout antiquity, the spring and autumn equinoxes, the constellation seen to rise behind the sun on the spring equinox, uh, was long considered to define the character of the world age. Uh, and the summer and winter solstices. Night and day are of exactly equal length on the equinoxes. Uh, we have the longest day in the northern hemisphere uh, in the June solstice and the shortest day in the northern hemisphere in the December solstice. And this is the precession of the equinoxes. The Earth's orbit, the, 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 the Earth's axis wobbles, and I'm showing that in this graphic. And because the Earth is the viewing platform from which we observe the stars, changes in the orientation of that viewing platform in space change the rising times and the appearance of particular stars. Uh, it's very noticeable on the horizon, for example, at the spring equinox. Right now, on the spring equinox, the sun is still rising against the background of the constellation of Pisces. We have lived in the age of Pisces, for the last couple of thousand years. But as we all know, we also live in the dawning of the age of Aquarius. This is a, an artifact of precession. Because of that wobble on the Earth's axis, the hundred or so years from now, we'll, we'll begin to see the sun rising against the background of the constellation of Aquarius instead of the constellation of Pisces. Uh, and that process proceeds at the rate of one degree every 72 years. It's very hard to observe. You have to keep records for a very long time to notice it. The second place it's obvious is at the pole. Right now, our pole star is Polaris. That's 
the star that the extended north pole of the Earth points most directly at. But this precessional wobble means that we will not always have Polaris as our pole star. Sometimes the North Pole will point at empty space, sometimes it'll point at, at other stars. And the whole phenomenon operates at the rate of one degree every 72 years, 30 degrees, one house of, house of zodiac in 2,160 years, 360 degrees the great year uh, in 25,920 years, which is 360 multiplied by 72. The great study on this was done by two professors of the history of science, Professor Giorgio de Santillana of Massachusetts Institute of Technology and his colleague Hertha von Deschen. This is Santillana standing here. They published their book, Hamlet's Mill, uh, in 1969, and it documents ancient worldwide knowledge of precession of the equinoxes encoded in myth, deliberately encoded in myth thousands of years before the time of the Greeks, who are supposed to have been the first people to notice precession. It's a sequence of numbers that are derived from the precession, derived from that heartbeat number, 72. 72 plus 36 is 108. Divide 108 by 2, you get 54. Uh, multiply 72 by 30, you get 2,160. Osiris was captured by Seth and his 72 assistants, and so on. You can read the myths. There are 10,800, the number of stanzas in the Rig Veda, 432,000, the number of syllables uh, in the Rig Veda. And Santillana and von Deschen, what they say is, you really have to comb through the book to find this because they knew it was politically incorrect. They attribute this knowledge to what they call some almost unbelievable ancestor civilization that had felt that the knowledge of the procession of the equinoxes was so important that it must be encoded in stories that could be passed down from generation to generation. It would not matter if the storyteller knew that he was conveying scientific information. As long as he told the story true and passed it on, it would come down through the ages. And these particular stories all contain a framework that when you look at it, it's obvious they're talking about the procession of the equinoxes. It's not only found in myth, it's found in monuments as well. Um, Angkor, for example, uh, 108 statues in each avenue, 54 on each side. 108 is 72 plus 36, 54 is that divided by two. So why am I showing you a picture of the Hoover Dam? Ah, because it has a star map built into its architecture. And Oscar Hansen, who put that star map there, uh, made it quite explicit. He believed that in remote ages to come, intelligent people with knowledge of precession would be able to discern the astronomical time of the dam location. If you want to pass a message down 10,000 years in the future, don't write it in your language. There's no guarantee anybody's going to read that language in the future or that the document will survive. Use something universal. Use a, a universal motion of our planet. Uh, and, and, and the changes in the star field that are caused by it. And that way, you can be sure that any later culture that is competent in astronomy will be able to work out the message. Now, actually, who gives a damn about when the Hoover Dam <laughs> was built? But I'm telling you this because I'm saying this is not such a strange idea. We do it in our time. Uh, and that's what uh, we think happened at Giza. Uh, the Great Sphinx, we think, was originally an entirely lion-bodied monument 12,000 years ago or so. Uh, its head was recarved in the dynastic period into the head of a pharaoh. And that's why the head is so out of proportion with the rest of the body of the Sphinx. 12,000 plus years ago was the age of Leo. It was when the constellation of Leo the Lion housed the sun on the spring equinox. The Great Sphinx is an equinoctial marker. It gazes precisely due east at the rising sun on the spring equinox. An hour before dawn, 12,800 years ago, this is what the Great Sphinx would have seen, its own celestial counterpart, the constellation of Leo, sitting on the horizon in line with its gaze. An hour passes. The disk of the sun bisects the horizon, and the mechanism of the heavens locks into place. At that exact moment, the constellation of Orion locks exactly due south on the meridian with the three belt stars in the pattern of the three great pyramids on the ground. And because of precession, the angle of the belt stars changes. It's wrong in 2500 BC. The layout of the pyramids matches the stars in 10,500 BC, 12 and a half thousand years ago. And this is the work of my friend and colleague, Robert Baval, the author of the Orion Mystery, to whom I wish to pay tribute. So 
The question is, if we go back 12 and a half thousand years, is there any evidence that anybody with scientific knowledge was present at Giza? And I would say yes, there is. First of all, the location of Giza on latitude 30 degrees north. That's one third of the way between the equator and the North Pole. That is not a random latitude. That is a deliberately chosen latitude. Secondly, the Great Pyramid is aligned with stunning precision to true north three sixtieths of a single degree off true north. It is locking itself in to the key dimensions of the planet. By the way, that's another reason why I don't think the Great Pyramid was built by aliens. Because if you can get here across interstellar space to this pale blue dot of the Earth, your navigation is really good. Uh, and if you're going to build your Great Pyramid, you're going to get it spot on true north, not three sixtieths of a single degree off. That's, that's human error. But it's astonishingly precise work. And they are going to great lengths to lock this monument in to our planet. And then there's something else. If you take the height of the Great Pyramid and multiply it by 43,200, you get the polar radius of the Earth. And if you measure the base perimeter of the Great Pyramid and multiply it by 43,200, you get the equatorial circumference of the Earth. Actually, Egyptologists know this, but they say it's a coincidence. What's the significance of the number 43,200, they say? Well, 43,200 is one of those numbers based on the number 72 generated by precession. In other words, in all those ages when we didn't even know we lived on a planet, let alone its dimensions, the Great Pyramid was always encoding the dimensions of our planet. And it did so on a scale defined by a key motion of the planet itself. That, to my mind, is incredibly sophisticated thinking. There's a three, four, five right triangle inside the so-called king's chamber of the Great Pyramid, a right triangle because it has a re rectangle on one side, three, four, five because its dimensions are in the proportion three, four, and five. Uh, this right triangle, when we scale it up, we find that it encodes the number 216, which is 3 times 72. Right triangles uh, are used in trigonometry and astronomy and earth measuring. And a 3, 4, 5 right triangle has a right angle here. Uh, and then the other two angles are 53.13 degrees and 36.87 degrees. Remember, these are used in trigonometry and earth measuring. So, so let's look at the mysterious ancient people who were known for their use of trigonometry and earth measuring. Um, they were called the Sabians. They were called the Sabians. And uh, one of their great men was Thabit ibn Kura, who lived in AD 836 to 901. Interestingly, the Sabians were allowed to maintain what Islam regarded as a pagan religion deep into the Islamic period. And Thabit ibn Kura, Ibn Kura even got away with saying, and I'm going to read this because it's beautiful, who else have civilized the world and built the cities if not the nobles and kings of paganism? Who else have set in order the harbors and rivers? And who else have taught the hidden wisdom? To whom else has the deity revealed itself, given oracles and told about the future, if not the famous men amongst the pagans? The pagans have made known all this. They have discovered the art of healing the soul. They have also made known the art of healing the body. They have filled the earth with settled forms of government and with wisdom, which is the highest good. Without paganism, the world would be empty and miserable. That was his testament at a time when Islam was growing and enforcing its will around the world. Uh, and their so-called pagan religion was defined as a kind of star worship, because these were people who were utterly focused upon the heavens and upon the stars, these Sabians. And then we discover that the Sabians, as late as the 12th century of our era, were making a pilgrimage to the pyramids of Giza. This is reported by the Arab geographer Yakut al-Hamawi, who lived from 1179 to 1229. He gives the dimensions of the two largest Giza pyramids in his geographical dictionary. And he adds to both of them, the Sabians made their pilgrimage. And a great Egyptologist called Salim Hassan makes the point that the Sabians were star worshippers. And if I guess rightly, they derived their name from the, from the Egyptian word sba, 
star. The Sabians were followers of an ancient religion, worshippers of the hosts of heaven, the heavenly bodies. Whatever the origin of their name may have been, the fact remains that they fully recognized the pyramids as monuments being connected with the stellar cult and revealed them as places of pilgrimage. So where did these mysterious Sabians come from who were making pilgrimage to Giza as recently as the 12th century of our era? They came from Haran, which is within spitting distance of Gobekli Tepe. And their temple of the moon was allowed to continue until the 12th century, when Islam finally cracked down upon it, banned their religion, and destroyed the temple and built a mosque on the site. The mosque has since fallen to pieces, but interestingly, the local inhabitants still maintain a tradition they call the surviving minaret. They call it the astronomical tower. There was an astronomical tower on the original temple of the moon of the Sabians, which goes back deep, deep into antiquity. Now, here is a discovery uh, of, I believe, rather extraordinary importance. And it's made by an archaeoastronomer called J.Q. Jacobs. And he's noticed something odd about the latitude of Haran. Haran is a renowned as a Sabian center associated with a moon temple and as an earlier Sumerian center. Haran was an important, once populous, prehistoric crossroad. And Jacob says, I noticed Haran's latitude is 36.87 degrees, the acute angle of a 345 geodetic triangle. Was knowledge of the latitude considered in locating a moon temple at Haran? When is a moon temple an observatory? When is idolatry an exact science? You see, the latitude of Haran is 36.87 degrees. And 36.87 degrees is not a random number. 36.87 degrees is the acute angle in a 345 right triangle, which is a, a, a very important instrument in trigonometry and earth measuring. So when we find a city that's associated with astronomy, trigonometry, earth measuring, and it turns out to be located on latitude 36.87 degrees north, it really stretches things to suggest that's a coincidence. It's deliberate. It was deliberately put on that site. Um, and something else, even more eerie, that J.Q. Jacobs has discovered. Gobekli Tepe lies exactly one one thousandth of the Earth's circumference north of Haran. The latitude distance is not random. It's exactly one thousandth of the Earth's circumference. And Jeku Jacob says, I turn back to Gobekli Tepe and Haran. Um, even non-archaeos understand stratifications and deposition basics. Deeper is older. Gobekli Tepe is 12,000 years old. Haran is equated with Abraham of biblical fame and with Ur of Sumeria, the civilized land, uh, and a cradle of civilization. That cradle in astronomy is presumed to be four to 5,000 years old, not 12,000. Haran is located at 3 over 4 Atan latitude, a fixed parameter, and Gobekli Tepe is at a specific latitude difference north. Because the fixed parameter must come first, the conundrum, of course, is that this precise 1 1,000th of circumference latitude difference is either coincidence or ancient astronomy just took a leap back to 12,000 years ago. And I think that's what this, this demonstrates, that ancient astronomy does take a leap back to the time of Gobekli Tepe. Uh, and indeed, uh, alignments with the rising of Sirius, with the stars of Orion's belt, with the setting of Deneb in the constellation of Cygnus have been proposed for the main circles of pillars at Gobekli Tepe. There's a rectangular structure there that's recognized as the world's first building purposely and accurately aligned to true north site, uh, uh, south, a feat that could only be accomplished using astronomy. I'll be finished in a few moments, I promise. <laughs> a very few moments. Gobekli Tepe and Haran are part of the Mesopotamian ambit. They're part of, we cannot separate them from Mesopotamia. Uh, and it's interesting when we go to Mesopotamia uh, that we find a civilizing figure uh, who emerges from the waters of ocean uh, and teaches the gifts of civilization to, to, a, to a primitive and savage people who are living in that area. They call him Oannes. It's from the Sumerian Uana Dapa. Uh, and he leads a group of seven sages, the seven Apkalu. Uh, they were regarded as magicians and as sorcerers. That's actually why I call my new book Magicians of the Gods. Um, and, and they are depicted as fish-garbed figures, wearing a sort of fish on their heads. Um, and weirdly, they carry these funny little man bags. 
And you see these cute little man bags? Yeah, that they're all carrying them. And even some carved examples of them have, have, have survived. Now, the strange thing is that exactly the same man bag uh, is found on the other side of the world um, in the earliest representation of Quetzalcoatl, the feathered serpent, uh, in Mexico. Quetzalcoatl was also a civilizing hero who brought the gifts of civilization. How do we explain this? How do we explain the same symbolism in these two completely separate places, supposedly not in contact with one another, and at different periods of history, unless we're looking at a remote common origin, uh, a remote common source that explains this? And then we find not only uh, are they found in Assyria in the third millennium BC and Iran in the third millennium BC, but the same man bags turn up on the top of Pillar 43 at Gobekli Tepe in Enclosure D. And there we know they're 12,000 years old. So what's going on here? Are we looking at some kind of secret symbolism, something like a Masonic handshake, uh, a way that a brotherhood recognized one another around the world? It's curious when you find the same iconography so widely distributed. Three or four minutes, stick with me and we'll be done. A little bit of speculation. Pillar 43, I'm not claiming this is fact, I'm just putting it out there, something to explore. Uh, and it's not me, actually, who's putting it out there. I'm, I'm, I'm sharing here and building upon the work of a friend and colleague of mine, uh, who is Paul Burley, uh, who originally published about Pillar 43 on my website back in 2013. And he is drawing some astronomical conclusions about this pillar. And what he's saying is what is important here, for some unknown reason, the builders of Gobekli Tepe constructed a temple apparently con highlighting a time 11,600 years in their future. Yet this scene is intentional. The symbolism is clear and in keeping with many mythologies describing this very same event occurring at the very time we live today. To understand this argument, I emphasize we are dealing with speculation, not fact here, but bear with me for a few more moments. To understand this argument, we should be aware that constellations are not fixed and firm things. They change their boundaries. Sometimes different cultures use a bit of one constellation and that we see as one constellation and a bit of another constellation. Uh, for example, the, the, the Mesopotamians had a constellation of the Bull of Heaven. It has a lot in common with our constellation of Taurus, uh, but also it, you know, they share the Hyades cluster as the head, but also a lot of differences. They grab different other stars. Um, the bow and arrow constellation of Mesopotamia is very like the bow and arrow constellation of China, uh, but, uh, but, but, but in, the, in, in the case of the Chinese, uh, the, the, the arrow is shorter and Sirius doesn't form the tip, it forms the target. The ancient Egyptians saw the constellation of Draco, weirdly, as a hippopotamus with a crocodile on its back. Uh, we depict it as a, a dragon uh, in the heavens. So these, these are the, 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 the images we impose upon the sky, the stars we connect together, it's rather flexible. This is the area of the sky we're interested in, uh, the area which is divided by the Milky Way and by the dark rift at the heart of the Milky Way. On one side is the constellation that we know as Sagittarius, and on the other side is the constellation that we know as Scorpio. It's recognized by astronomers that this part of the constellation of Sagittarius forms a distinct asterism on its own. Actually, uh, astronomers call it the teapot. Yeah, because that's the cozy, and there's the spout of the teapot, and there's the handle of the teapot. And these are the brightest stars in the constellation of Sagittarius. So this is the speculative suggestion, that uh, the vulture on the stone represents the teapot bit of Sagittarius that we now see as the upper body of a centaur archer. And something that adds to that is if we look into the devolution of these ideas down the ages. If we go to Mesopotamia, um, we'll find depictions of Sagittarius on Kuduru stones from the Babylonian period, the second millennium BC. Well, this one looks pretty painful, I have to say. <laughs> but but, but the, the relationship of the scorpion to the winged figure is rather like the relationship of this scorpion to the winged figure. Uh, and, and, and here, here the Sagittarius figure has actually got the body of a scorpion and the and the feet of a bird, rather like this bird uh, here. Uh, did the idea that there should be a scorpion and a bird in this region of the heavens persist for thousands of years, even while other figures changed their character and the, the notion of a centaur archer was introduced? Cutting a long story short, what we're suggesting is that that's how they saw the sky at Gobekli Tepe. Uh, they, they 
give us a constellation diagram here. Sagittarius, the head of our Scorpio is this little chick here. The tail of our Scorpio overlaps this scorpion. The the, 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 here is the corona australis and so on and so forth. That this is the constellation diagram. Here is Ophiuchus, the serpent holder. Here is Serpens, the serpent that Ophiuchus holds. Um, when did this happen? When does the sun sit there in the picture as we see it on pillar 43? Does that help us to pin this down? Again, it must be at one of the key moments of the year, venerated by, in ancient cultures since time immemorial. Well, it didn't happen, nine, if, if it happened 9,600 years ago, it didn't happen at the spring equinox, because then the sun was in Leo. Uh, it didn't happen at the autumn equinox, because 9,600 years ago, the sun was in Aquarius at the autumn equinox. Uh, it did not happen at the summer solstice, when the sun was in the claws of Scorpio. And it did not happen at the winter solstice 9,600 years ago when the sun was in Taurus. Again, cutting a long story, very short indeed. The only time this happens is at the winter solstice in our epoch, the epoch of the 21st of December, 2012. Yeah? Just when we thought it was safe to get back in the water <laughs> after all the fuss about the Mayan calendar, Here's Hancock buying, banging on about the Mayan calendar again. Let's look at this a little bit further. My friend and colleague, John Major Jenkins, is one of the great authorities on the Mayan calendar. And John had been making it clear for years that the Maya did not say the world would come to an end on the 21st of December 2012. That is never the claim of the Mayan calendar. What he rightly says is that the ancient Maya believed that the years around 2012 would be attended by great changes. And in accordance with their world, change creation, world age creation mythology, the transformation of human beings into something uh, completely new. Actually, uh, you cannot separate the Mayan calendar from the precession of the equinoxes. In the Mayan scheme of things, 21 December 2012 marked the end of the 13th Bactun of the fourth age of the world. Uh, and we now live in the fifth age of the world, the beginning of the fifth age of the world. All the numbers of the Mayan calendar are processional numbers based on the procession of the equinoxes. Uh, and, and, and this is something that is very important to keep into account. What they were observing was the slow movement of the sun towards alignment with the center of the galaxy on the winter solstice, the moment of cosmic rebirth. And the center of the galaxy was of great importance to the ancient Maya. They saw this as the cosmic womb out of which new age would be born. So this is profound and powerful symbolism. When the sun on the winter solstice, the death of the old year, the beginning of the new, lines up with the center of the galaxy like a, a bead on the end of a rifle barrel. And that has been unfolding slowly because of precession for thousands and thousands of years. And it's only in our time on the winter solstice that the sun sits there targeting the galactic center. And uh, it's a window. It's not a moment. You have to take the diameter of the sun into account. It's a window that's about 80 years wide, spanning the period from 1960 to 2040. That's when this happens, and that's what we're suggesting is written on Pillar 43 at Gobekli Tepe. Are they possibly passing us a message? Is that time capsule, that deliberate burial, a message? Are they trying to tell us something? Pay attention to the heavens when the sun is between Sagittarius and Scorpio, lined up with the dark rift of the, the Milky Way on the winter solstice. The ancient Egyptians also, I'll do this very quickly, but the skies have turned around exactly 180 degrees. We are halfway down, the, we are half a processional cycle on from the period of 12,000 500 years ago. Then Orion was at its lowest point, Draco was at its highest, Leo was rising in the east, Aquarius was setting in the west. Now we come, Aquarius rising in the east, Leo setting in the west, Orion at its highest point, Draco at its lowest. There's a, an echo between the two periods, between 12,800 years ago and our period today. And this echo is associated with the tradition of the phoenix, which the ancient Egyptians called the Bennu bird. And in many ancient traditions, the cycle of the phoenix is associated with the full processional year. 
And Salinas, for example, tells us that the phoenix returns every 12,954 years. Cicero used the same number, and that, within a tiny margin of error, is half the processional cycle. We are half a processional cycle on from the first time from Zeptepi, as the ancient Egyptians defined it. So are we being warned of possible further cataclysmic impacts halfway around the processional clock, when the sun is in Sagittarius against the background of the center of the galaxy, and the phoenix returns to cause havoc and the rebirth of worlds? NASA's reassuring figure of 100 million a year intervals between extinction level events is complacent and irresponsible, and now we know just plain wrong, because we had an extinction level event 12,800 years ago. And NASA is often making calming pronouncements about how safe our cosmic environment is. And it, it says that um, all potentially hazardous asteroids, all known potentially hazardous asteroids have a less than a 0.01% chance of impacting the Earth in the next 100 years. Well, that's true. But the problem is the unknown ones. The problem is the ones they haven't seen yet. And the, Scientific estimate is that so far only 1% of potentially hazardous asteroids have been identified, with 99%, more than 100,000 of them, still awaiting discovery, crossing the orbit of the Earth. We had an example of this just recently, the so-called Halloween flyby of a half kilometer wide, actually part of a comet, half a kilometer wide, that passed just the moon's distance from the Earth. Now, the moon's distance from the Earth sounds like a lot, OK? But in cosmic terms, in this vast universe, that's like a bullet whizzing by and taking off your ear. The problem is that that half kilometer object, which would have changed life on Earth had it hit us, was only noticed by NASA 20 days before it passed us, with no time to do anything about it. Uh, and scientists are becoming actually more and more concerned that Earth could be at risk of meteor impacts, and we might wrongly have assumed we are in a safe era. Uh, and this is the view of the astronomers whose attention I've drawn you to, and, uh, uh, and their mathematician colleague, Emilio Spidicato, at the University of Bergamo. They've done the calculations on the torrid meteor stream. Uh, they are certain that there's between one and 200 asteroids more than a kilometer in diameter orbiting with, within the torrid meteor stream, and that there's one of them that's at least 30 kilometers in diameter. And this unique complex of debris, they write, is undoubtedly the greatest collision hazard facing the Earth at the present time. I am not here to say the end of the world is nigh. I do not want to manifest any kind of gloom and doom. Never, never, never. This is a problem we can do something about. It's a matter of choice. I like the little cartoon. All I'm saying is, now is the time to develop the technology to deflect an asteroid. <laughs> we have the technology. We have it already. We have the technology. I won't go into the details. There isn't time, but we have it. We have the technology to make our cosmic environment entirely safe and to ensure that no such risk, no such extinction level event need ever happen again. But at the moment, we're so busy generating this climate of global hatred and fear and suspicion. We're so invested in military expenditure, trillions of dollars on military expenditure, what to do to murder and destroy one another, uh, and almost nothing. A few 10, 20 million dollars is all that the global community spends on looking out for asteroids and comets right now. The choice is ours. We do not need to be the next lost civilization. We can do something about this, but we need to put our eye on the ball. What is needed is a grand human project that brings together all of humanity as brothers and sisters that we truly are to protect this wondrous planet that the universe has given us. Last two slides. Taken from NASA satellites. We see the areas that our so-called advanced technological society lit up, glowing like jewels at night. And uh, you know, this, is, this is usually taken as a sign of the technological advancement of our society. I mean, the tragedy is when you live in a city, you can't see the bloody stars because of light pollution. You know? But if you look it down on the Earth, you certainly see our cities glowing with light. At the same time, areas, much of Africa, the Kalahari Basin, where the, 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 the um, Kalahari Bushmen live, for example, um, or the, the Amazon Basin, uh, are, are completely dark. 
uh, because these areas are not electrified. They're not centers of technological pro progress. And indeed, there are, there are uncontacted tribes in the Amazon who, who <laughs> when an airplane flies by, that's the first time they knew we even existed. Okay? Now, this is the interesting thing. Our civilization is very fragile, I believe. We're very strong in one way, and we're strong because we specialize. Um, everybody's really good at something, but not very good at anything else. Um, I have no idea how to survive. If I were put in a survival situation, I'd be gone within a week. I'd, I don't know what to do. I, I, I write books. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not a survivalist. Um, the networks of our society are deeply, complexly interconnected, and that's where our strength comes from. But if you fracture those networks, if you admit a global cataclysm into the picture, our advanced technological civilization, which has, like Atlantis, become arrogant and cruel, which does impose its will all around the world, which does not wear its prosperity with moderation, our technological civilization would fall completely and would be gone. And those who would carry the human story forward would be the meek of the earth. It would be the hunter-gatherers, because they have the survival skills. They exercise them every day. A cataclysm like this would barely touch them. Some of us who survived might settle amongst them and try to share some of what we know with them and depend upon them for our survival. And 10,000 years from now, the descendants of those hunter-gatherers might remember a time in myth and tradition when a great advanced civilization with almost magical powers lived upon the earth. My goodness, they could fly in the sky. They could go to the moon. Uh, they could speak to one another on the other side of the planet. The only problem is that that lost civilization would be our own. Let's make sure it doesn't happen. We've been given a precious gift by the universe to live on this gorgeous garden of a planet and the privilege to be born in a human body. All that's needed is love. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. Thank you.